No? What happens is this drawing utility gets frozen, and I have to reboot. Let's see, where did we leave off? Um, after we did that, um, we, did, we did domain and range. We solved these quadratics. Yeah, it should be after the graphs. We solved these. Okay. Yeah, because we did these, and then we ran out of time. I don't remember doing the piecewise. I uh, know we uh we haven't yet. Okay, let's start. Let's we'll start with number two then. Uh, hold on a second. Just have to figure out how to. There it is. Okay. Picture of it. The secret to the piecewise graphing is to start right there. And let's talk about that. What that means is that everywhere to the left of that line, in other words, in this entire zone, I'm going to graph the function x, the absolute value of x plus 1. It's exactly the way to look at it. Well, the absolute value of x plus 1 has a vertex right there. And it's shaped like a V. Well, I got that much of the V. But this much only goes to there. You with me? Yeah. And... It's an open zero right there, because it's only when it's less than 1 is it this function. Now, the next zone we want to look at is this one. And I call them zones because I think it's helpful to picture that. That's the zone where we're going to graph the next function. The next piece of the function, I should say. Okay? It's the square root of x minus 3. Well, square root of x graphs like... This. What's the square root of x minus 3 look like? Um, up three higher? Down three lower. It's minus three. So it's a vertical shift down. So I'm going to take this black curve and move it down by three units. Start it right there. And draw it just like I normally would, only I'm going to stop when I get the two. In other words, it's going to look something like that. Still got this. Still got an open circle there. Do I have a closed or an open circle on each side of this middle function? Where I'm pointing, is that a closed or an open circle? Uh, closed. About there. Uh, closed. Now, the last zone is everything to the right of that. Okay? And I want to plot that function. Well, that's a linear function, meaning it's a straight line. And I used to do this in a bad way, which was I would graph that line all the way to the y-axis, and then I would erase everything from 0 to 2. You get that method? I'm going to do that um, method just so you can see what I'm talking about. 
Um, in other words, it would start, you know, the problem with doing that method is I'm going to totally mess up my graph here if I do it that way. So I'm not going to do that method. I'm going to show you how to do it. You substitute x for that number right there. You substitute in the function. What do you get? Um, you substitute it into that function right there. Even though it says x has to be greater than 2, we're going to substitute 2 to see where we start. Um, negative 5. That's where we're going to start, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 with an open circle. That's where I start. Now, what's my slope? Um, negative... Three. Okay. Well, how do you get a slope of negative three? I go down three and to the right one. So now is all I got to do is finish drawing that line, that straight line. There is my piecewise function. Now, had I done it, uh, first of all, make sure you understand the end result. Now, had I done it the old way that I used to do it, that's not the correct way to do it. I would have done it this way. I'm going to mess the curve up, but you'll see what I'm talking about. I would have plotted that in green all the way to the y-axis, and I would have gone all the way to the y-axis because that's in y equal mx plus b format. So I, I know how to graph that real easily if I can start on the y-axis. So I would start there, and then I would apply the slope of down 3 over 1, and again down 3 over 1, and I would draw that line. Then I would go back and I would erase the part that's between 0 and 2. That right there. And I would end up with what I ended up with full before. It's just I didn't have to do all that. In other words, doing all this extra work is not only hard, and you have to erase it, but it messes up your graph, something fierce. So there, you, there's no need to go all the way back to the y-axis. Is all you need to know is where do you start in the spot that you're supposed to be starting from. I'm supposed to be starting at 2. Well, that equation is going to start at minus 5 if I have to start at 2. And it's going to have the same slope. But I just make it an open circle, and that handles the fact that it's got to be greater than 2. Most important thing is that in this entire zone, I'm graphing that function, y equals minus 3x plus 1. That's what I'm graphing only in the zone greater than 2. But the way to do that is to plug in 2 for x to see where you start, and then apply the slope. Okay. Do okay. The, let's do the same thing for the next problem. Now, these are a little tough because be better if you had a drawing tablet and I made you the presenter and you could draw it. That's what it's asking you to do. Where am I going to start? Uh, by drawing the absolute value of x. Well, not really. I'm going to start right there. That identifies my zone. I draw a dotted line at x equal 2, my 
zone is right there. Then I'm going to graph this function. With me? These piecewise functions yeah. aren't hard at all. You just have to know how to look at them. And if you don't know how to look at them, they're really hard. But if you know how to look at them, they're quite easy. Now, what does absolute value of x plus 3 look like? Um, it, uh, the vertex is on, uh, is, uh, 3, 0, and it's, uh, v. Is that a vertical shift or a horizontal shift? Oh, vertical, sorry. Okay. So, I'm going to go to where absolute value of x would be, move it up 3 units. There's my new vertex. Nothing else has changed, but I only want to take it over to that dotted line. And closed circle there, because it's less than or equal to 2, with an arrow there, meaning it goes on forever. Now, the only other zone is this zone. So, the other function needs to be graphed there. Well, where's the other, where am I going to start? Well, first of all, what does that function look like? y equal minus x squared. Tell me, describe it as best you can. Um, an upside down u. Good. Upside down parabola. Going through the vertex at the origin. The problem is, in the zone we're in, we don't go through the origin. So I could kind of do it like this and then erase the part that's not in our zone. But again, let's not do it that way. Where should I start? Uh, by putting 2 in for x. Okay. So what is f of x when x equals 2? Uh, negative 4. Okay, so it's right there, and it's an open circle. So that's my starting point, and I know that it goes through the origin, so it's got to look something like that, right? In other words, if I were to draw the other half of it, it would go through that origin. So actually, it has to go through that point right there. Let me redraw it a little bit better. because it is symmetrical. There you have. And that's what it looks like. And that's how you do piecewise functions. Notice that I always start in the upper right and then work my way down on the right side so that I can tell which zones they are talking about. These zones are always vertical zones like that or that one. Alright. Hold on a second. No. You wanted to skip the graphing? You're good with graphing all of these? Yeah. We didn't do C or D. All of these are transformations. What's the parent function on C? Uh, absolute value of X. What transformations are going on, starting from the left to the right? Um, a stretch factor. Start with the negative right. sign. Always start with the negative sign. I switch over the X. Okay, and then the two? Uh, stretch factor. And the plus 3? Uh, horizontal shift to the left. And the minus 5? A uh, vertical shift down. Right. On E, what's the parent function? Um... 1 over x. What two things are happening? What's the minus 2 do? Um, a horizontal shift to the right. Good. And what's the plus 3 do? A vertical shift up. 
Okay? And notice that both of those, in other words, this function here has a vertical and a horizontal asymptote. The y-axis is the horizontal, or excuse me, the vertical, and the x-axis is the horizontal. So when I do a horizontal shift, I'm moving that vertical asymptote two, two points to the right. And when I do a vertical shift up of three units, I'm moving the horizontal asymptote up three units to the right. And that's always the first step for graphing. In other words, you know that the function is hyperbolic in nature. So it's always going to look like a hyperbola, only it's going to follow the new grid that we put on there. And that's how you graph them. The most important part of graphing these hyperbolic functions is to put your grid down. And that's always based on the vertical, in other words, the first question, if they're asking you any questions about this, it's always what's the vertical asymptote, what's the horizontal asymptote, what's the x-intercepts, what's the y-intercepts, things like that. But they always start with that because that determines your vertical dotted line, that determines your horizontal dotted line, that lays down your grid, then you can graph it. How's your factoring ability? That's good. Okay. Let me pick some of the harder ones here then. And I'll test you. So you don't feel like we need to go through each of these? Oh, no. Well, first of all, I'm a little confused. So A is this quadratic divided by this multiplied by that? Yeah. Okay, let's do that one. Hold on, i got to blow it up a little bit. For some reason, the zoom. The secret to all of these is the factoring. That's why it's under the section factoring. In other words, it's, it looks like a division and a multiplication problem, but it's really a factoring problem. So factor that. Um. X plus 10, X minus 3. Now, let's factor the numerator and turn it into multiplication. This is an unusual problem. I guess without parentheses, we are to assume that we are dividing by that, and then we're multiplying the original quadratic by that. If, if it was anything other than that, they would need to use parentheses, and they did not. So, let's pretend we're multiplying by x plus 2 over, factor that. Um. And if I lose you, stop me. I don't want to lose you, for sure. Uh, x minus 3, x plus 8. So, that takes care of that. I flipped and multiplied. I don't like what I'm seeing here. Factor this bottom. Uh, x plus 1, x plus 2. No, well, I guess we're all right. Because these problems are always cancellation problems. And now you get your answer by canceling anything that you can. There's an x minus 3 and an x minus 3. There's an x plus 2 and an x plus 2. 
What does that give me? That gives me in the numerator x plus 10 times x plus 2, and you want to leave it like that. There's no need to multiply that together. And in the denominator, I've got an x plus 8 and an x plus 1, and I can't do anything with either one of those. That's the final answer. The only question I had at all was, are we dividing by that? Or are we just dividing by this term and then we're multiplying by that? And that's what I assumed. And that's why I said parentheses matter a lot here. If I put parentheses around it like that, then we're dividing by this whole term. But without parentheses, then you have to do the division by that term and then multiplication by this term, which is what we did. Let me just ask you some key questions as to whether you understand how to do these. You don't really want to waste your time if you know how to do them. First of all, factor the first term. Uh, x plus 3, x plus 3. Factor the second term. Um, x minus 3x plus 3. Now what should I do? It's not an equation. It's an expression. So they want us to add the middle term and subtract the third term. Uh, find a common denominator. What's it going to be? Uh, x plus 3 times x minus 3. Good. And what's that new numerator equal to? Uh, 2x plus 5. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let's back up. That's not our common denominator. Remember what the definition of a common denominator has to be. Every term, in other words, each of our three denominators have to divide evenly into this common denominator. This term right there does not divide evenly into our common denominator. So I need another x plus 3. That's my common denominator. You with me? Yeah. Okay, now what is my numerator going to be with that new common denominator? 2x plus 5 times x minus 3. We know that's correct because the x minus 3s would cancel and I'd be left with what I started with. So that's proper. Now going to run out of room. I never learn. That also has to be the same common denominator. What's this numerator? X times uh, X plus 3. And finally, the third term, which I'll write over here also has the same common denominator. I could write that x plus 3 squared, but it's actually more understandable if I don't. What's the numerator on the third term? Uh, 1 times x plus 3 times x plus 3. So now we have three common denominators. So I can operate on all of the numerators. And in order to operate on them, I'm going to have to multiply these all together. Because this numerator is a quadratic, this numerator is a quadratic, and that numerator is a quadratic. So I'm going to have at least three x squared terms. 
that I'll be able to combine together. So this problem is actually a very, very complicated problem. Uh, not that easy to get the common denominator correct. Um, just always remember that the common denominator must be divisible evenly by every single denominator that you're looking at. And just x plus 3 times x minus 3 was not divisible by that denominator, by that denominator. So it had to be x plus 3 times x plus 3 times x minus 3. Now, we could waste 10 more minutes doing this. Should we do it or go on? In other words, do you have any questions about what's going to happen at this point on this problem? I've got, I've got this numerator that I've got to add to that numerator, and then I've got to subtract that numerator. And that will be my new numerator, and it will all be over my common denominator. Did you lose audio for a second? Nicholas, you still there? Having lots of technical problems today. I don't know what to do about it, but yeah, I kind of lost my connection to my. I don't know why. I saw that. It it's it tells me you went offline, but I also heard a beep. That when you went offline, it beeped. Um, so how do you get back online? You have to reboot or something, or yeah, I just don't know how long it'll take. Yeah, no, I understand. Are you on a PC? What's your operating system? Uh, no. What? Um, like, what the, um, what type of computer? It's a Dell, but is it a Microsoft version 10? Or 7? Or Vista? That'll tell me how long it takes you to reboot. It's a, it's a Google Chrome. Well, that's your browser. Uh, you're probably going to need to reboot and just go ahead and do it. And, uh, and it'll take however long it takes. Um, and that's the best way to proceed. I'll leave the session up with that meeting ID number. Do you have it written down somewhere? Yeah. So I'll just hang up and let you reboot your computer, get back in to go to meeting, and I'll see you when you come back on. And then, okay. were we using the audio, we were using the audio through the phone? The computer. Oh, good. So I don't have to call you, we'll have audio through the computer. Yeah. All right, talk to you in a few. Okay. Bye-bye.
We must have been using the audio from our phones. Uh, I'm not getting any audio through GoToMeeting. Yeah, my audio won't connect. I don't know why. Okay. Just make sure you set your audio on telephone instead of computer audio, otherwise you might get some feedback. 